Dear God, I pray that as we open up your scripture today, that we will be reminded of your truth, of your redeeming love, and that we will find evidence of the Holy Spirit within your scripture, now and forever. Amen. Well, Ecclesia, if you have been joining us in this series, you know that we are covering the book of Acts. And last week, Pastor Sean talked about Acts chapter 2 and the power of the Holy Spirit, not just in the early church, but in our church, in our lives. And the reason this is so significant, as Pastor Sean alluded to, is because when Jesus came, he quite literally told us, when I am gone, you will not be alone. I will be alive within you through the Holy Spirit. You know, the book of John, the gospel of John reads, in a little while, by the way, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, the world will not see me, but I will not vanish completely from your sight. Because I live, you will also live. Now, remember, resurrection is the opposite of death. So he's saying, because I live, you will live. And at that, time, at that time, you will know that I am in the Father. You are in me, and I am in you. And so we have this theology as a church that we are not alone. The Holy Spirit is not just with us, but within us. Because we know that from the words of Jesus. And if you're like me, it's not always easy to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in a given moment. Sometimes when I am making a decision, I wonder what is God and what is my ego? And I don't always know the difference. And what I find helpful is going back to this passage in Galatians that reminds us that the Holy Spirit's voice will come with some fruit, right? And the fruits of the Holy Spirit are unconditional love, joy, peace, patience, kind-heartedness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You won't find any law opposed to fruit like this. And so when I am in discernment over a decision, I can think about, will this produce unconditional love, patience, kindness, self-control? And if the answer is no, then perhaps it's not the voice of the Holy Spirit. I know um, in past sermons up here years ago, Um, I've talked about a past with addiction that I've had, as well as a struggle with OCD. And I can tell you, when I was active in addiction, or if I'm struggling with OCD, I do not have patience. I do not have self-control, right? Compulsions are quite literally the opposite of patience and self-control. And so I know that to perform a compulsion is not within my best interests, according to the Holy Spirit. And so it's been a helpful guide for me to discern the difference. But today, our topic that I've been assigned is not the Holy Spirit, but this tiny little topic of resurrection. And it's quite literally the event that founded the early church. Resurrection is why we are gathered here today, and it is the main event celebrated in Acts. Now, I've been assigned Acts chapter 3 through 431, and that's a lot of texts. And I have this saying, you've probably heard me say it before, that the Bible preaches better than I do, so we're going to read a good chunk of the first portion of Acts 3 together, And I am going to insert some commentary, or as they would say in seminary school, I'm going to insert an exegesis 
And what I want you to know is that my comments and what I emphasize in this story are often inspired not from my own Holy Spirit within, but from the theology of N.T. Wright. As I prepared for this sermon, I read Acts Part 1 for Everyone, written by N.T. Wright. I highly recommend this book. And so if I'm emphasizing something, just know that it's probably not me. Somebody much smarter than me decided this was important. And I'm quoting N.T. Wright throughout scripture. So Acts 3 starts out, and it is this miracle story. It says, one day at three o'clock in the afternoon, a customary time for daily prayer, Peter and John walked to the temple. Some people were carrying in a man who had been paralyzed since birth. Every day they brought him to a place near the beautiful gate, one of the temple entrances, so he could beg for money from people entering to worship. He saw Peter and John coming and asked them for a contribution. Peter gazed intensely at him, and so did John. So picture, Peter and John, they're walking to church. They see this beggar, who they've probably seen there for a decade, outside the entrance of the church. Peter makes eye contact with him, and then he says, look at us. Now this is significant, because the normal thing for us to do when we pass the same unhoused person every day, what's often most comfortable is what? To look away, to avoid eye contact. But Peter did the exact opposite with intention. And he asked the beggar, the paralyzed man, look at us. The man looked up at them assuming they were about to give him some money. That's what the man was asking for, money. And Peter said, I want to give you something, but I don't have any silver or gold. Here's what I can offer you. Stand up and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed one. Now this is different. Peter said, stand up and walk in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And what you need to know is that Jesus was known for saying that same sentence, stand up and walk. But this time, Peter was not giving credit to himself. He was giving credit to a man who was no longer physically there. So he's quite literally suggesting that this is the work of the Holy Spirit, not himself. Then Peter took the man's right hand and lifted him to his feet. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles grew strong. He jumped and walked, accompanying Peter and John into the temple where he walked, jumped for joy, and he shouted his praises to God. So Peter and John performed this miracle Through the Holy Spirit, they heal this man who had been paralyzed. He asks for money, but they give him healing. And Peter and John point to the significance of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit as the reason why this was able to happen. Well, this event called quite a stir. So on Solomon's porch, people gathered after this because they saw that this man was healed And these are the same people that had likely been passing this man for decades. And all of a sudden, he could walk. And Peter does a couple things as he addresses the crowd. One, he gives credit to God. And he doesn't just say Jesus. He says, the God of your ancestors, of Isaac, of Jacob, this is the same God working this miracle. So Peter is referencing the Old Testament and saying, hey, you know that God we believe in our Torah? He's going to act new miracles through Jesus. So he's working as a bridge to this theology. Peter also says something interesting to the crowd. And I don't think the crowd was ready for this. The crowd likely wanted to celebrate a miracle, 
But he looked at the crowd and he said, the man who performed this healing, you betrayed on the cross. You let him die. You killed the very author of life. Or other translations say the prince of life. And that is significant because the prince of life, we, also, we often call Jesus the prince of peace. And that's true also. But resurrection is all about being the prince of life. And he says, ironically, you killed the prince of life. And he asked for their repentance. But he also says something important as he's addressing this crowd. He says that it is faith in Jesus that healed this man. And I love this reframe because he doesn't say Jesus healed the man. He says faith in Jesus healed the man. And that puts some ownership on us. If Jesus isn't around to be working miracles, it is through our faith that we are responsible for being miracle workers in the world and bringing about a resurrected life here and now for all people. The story continues in Acts 4. And um, Jesus was not the only person who was innocent on the cross. There was also another innocent character in this story, and that's Peter and John. They just performed a miracle. But like Jesus, they would be prosecuted for doing what was right. And so Peter and John are taken to jail with this healed man for what? For performing a miracle? for preaching resurrection. And so it picks up in Acts 4. The conversation continued for a few hours there on Solomon's porch. Suddenly, the head of the temple police and some members of the Sadducean party interrupted Peter and John. They were annoyed because Peter and John were enthusiastically teaching that in Jesus, resurrection of the dead is possible. So they're not arrested for the miracle necessarily. They're arrested because they're preaching that in Jesus, resurrection of the dead is possible. An idea that the Sadducees completely rejected. Now, do you, do you know how you remember that it's the Sadducees that completely rejected this idea? Because they were sad, you see? I know, it's so bad. Should I leave? I can leave. The story continues. So they arrested Peter, John, and the man who was healed and kept them in jail overnight. But during these few afternoon hours, between the man's miraculous healing and their arrest, Peter and John already had convinced about 5,000 more people to believe their message about Jesus. So what that tells me, Ecclesia, is that you can arrest people but you cannot arrest the Holy Spirit. And luckily for us, Peter and John had already told 5,000 people. The message had spread to 5,000 people about the resurrection. And so while they tried to contain this message in jail, it could not be contained because the Holy Spirit cannot sit in a jail cell. It has already been unleashed through resurrection. What you also need to know about this text is that the Sadducees, they were not only sad because they didn't believe in resurrection, but they didn't want to believe in resurrection for very good reason. You see, the Sadducees had a lot of political power. They had economic power and social power. So why would they want to give up power to a new ruler? Instead of the Roman Empire, instead of Caesar being king, now Jesus was Lord. And they didn't want a new Lord because life was working out for them. They liked how the power was tipped in their favor. N.T. Wright put resurrection this way. Resurrection always was a radical, dangerous doctrine, an attack on the status quo, and a threat to existing power structures. 
I think there's so much we can take from that story. And I've narrowed it down to three things that I think really challenge us as a community as we read this scripture. One of them is that God invites us to heal instead of offering us what we want or what we think we want. You know, that man that was healed, what did he ask for? He asked for money. He couldn't even have the imagination for how God could work a healing in his life. He didn't even know how to ask for that. And I am not against giving people money. People need money to survive, right? That is like baseline. But God had a bigger imagination for this person. And I think oftentimes in our lives, what we think we want is not the actual thing. At least that's true for me. Maybe you want your family to stop fighting whenever you get together. But what you really need is for somebody to heal their alcoholism or their codependency. Maybe you want so badly to be thin or to have a larger jacked body. But what you actually need is to heal disordered eating or body dysmorphic disorder. Maybe you want that anger in your life to go away. But what you actually need is to heal generational trauma within your own life. See, so often God invites us to a deeper healing when we don't want or get what we think we want. But this theology can often seem problematic. If we have a God that offers deeper healing, why would a two and a half year old die from neuroblastoma? Why would bombs be dropped on innocent civilians. See, there's this problem of evil in the world that this theology seems like it doesn't account for. But that brings me to our second point, and really N.T. Wright's point. He says that resurrection is a beginning, not an ending. We don't live in heaven we don't live in a perfect world. Resurrection was a starting. It was a place for us to practice bringing the kingdom come, but we live in an in-between where heaven is not fully here, yet it is here. I was, a um, couple, couple weeks ago, the day was a little chaotic at our house. Um, our, our baby had four double ear infections and we finally got him tubes. And he has another surgery coming up for something else. It's the happiest baby ever. And um, we were off of our nap schedules. Nobody was sleeping. My son decided to take a um, Costco-sized box of Cheerios and just casually dump it throughout the house. And I handed him a handheld vacuum, which he thought was amazing. So he cleaned it all up perfectly. And I was so proud of him. I said, good job, Jet. And he thought that was so fun that he decided to dump out the vacuum Cheerios and do it again. And when I looked over at him, I caught him eating them after they had been in the vacuum. And you know what? It was the kind of day where I didn't even care. I was like, that is a great snack. And I, I looked at him and I said, Jet, that is disgusting. And he laughed and he said, I know. <laughs> and so that was just the day at our house, okay? It was chaos. And our baby needed to nap. I turned off all the lights. I lit a candle. And I'm rocking baby Sonny in 
in the crevice of my neck right here. And all of a sudden, this song comes on the radio. Not the radio, our Alexa. And it was a song I used to always play on my boombox as a teenager up in my room. And it was Nora Jones. And she sang, Come away with me in the night. And I could feel Sonny's breath get deeper and deeper in my neck. And I'm rocking him, looking at a flickering candle flame. And Nora sings, I want to walk with you on a cloudy day in fields where the yellow grass grows knee high. Won't you try to come? And for just a moment, in that chaotic day, I felt heaven on earth, and it was fleeting, but it was there. And I think that's what it means to be human. We have these moments where we know heaven is real, but we don't live in there fully because we're caught in the in-between. And I also know that resurrection is a beginning, but it should also be a beginning for our theology. Because so often our beginning is what we heard on the news. I truly believe that politics is a new religion for many people. There's a moral purity culture on both sides where people tend to worship political ideologies, perhaps more than resurrection. And I'm not saying that the scriptures or your faith should not be political. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I think it is. I know it is. But our starting point is always resurrection. And I'm afraid that if resurrection is not our starting point, that we can get radicalized. I was recently, in my postpartum months, radicalized on TikTok. I get my TikTok videos from Instagram like a normal millennial. But I was scrolling through these videos for two weeks of this trend online called homesteading. And it's these women in long gowns and they have like 175 children. <laughs> and they have chickens and cattle and they bake everything from scratch. And they live in their own little isolated community and they're often barefoot in their gown with just babies dripping off them making sourdough bread. And no shade on this way of life. I think it's awesome. But as, as I was consuming these videos, I'm telling my husband, we need to do this. <laughs> and he said, Erica, you make every meal in the microwave. How, how do you think, like, I can't even stay on top of clean, clean underwear and socks, and I think I'm going to raise cattle and goats now. And I realized that I had fallen for this idea, this romanticized 90-second video with music in the background of what a life could be like. That was not from the Holy Spirit. That was me being radicalized on TikTok. And by the way, if you are a homesteader, please invite me over. I'd love to eat, but you have to cook. <laughs> but we get lost in the world when we don't start with the Holy Spirit and with resurrection. And it's so easy to get lost in the world. And finally, this is my last point, and it might seem controversial, but I don't think it is. And that's from this story, we know that the church is not in the business of charity. It is in the business of resurrection. Now, charity is good, right? Um, living water that we often uh, pair up with at Ecclesia. In fact, Mike is here from Living Water today. Living water does amazing things. But the reason we partner up with living water is not because we believe in charity. 
It's because we believe in resurrection. That's why we do charity. Charity is not a belief, but it's an outflow of the theology of resurrection that says all things must be restored. The kingdom is not just to come, but it is also to be brought here on earth as it is in heaven now. And because we believe that, of course we're going to do charitable acts. But it starts with resurrection. In that story, Peter and John did not walk past that man and think, well, I really believe in charity. I should do this. No, they said, I believe in resurrection. So this man can have a different life. Not later, but now. Now, I ran a a small nonprofit for seven years. And we uh, connected students to opportunity. And I'll never forget when students would be around and the word charity would come up, I'd always cringe a little. I kind of hope that my students didn't hear that word. Because I never wanted them to feel like a charity case. I wanted them to feel like part of a larger revolution. A revolution like resurrection that believes that Christianity is not just an invite for God's select chosen people, but it's for all people. And that the walls that say who is in and who is out are no longer there, not because we believe in charity or because we're great people, but because we know that resurrection is real, not just in the future, but now. And it starts with Jesus in the book of Acts. Ecclesia, let me pray with you. Dear God, help us to be a people that don't just believe the reality of resurrection, but that live it. That like Pastor Chris's sermon on Easter, that we're constantly pointing to examples of renewal after crucifixion, saying not look what we can do, but look what Jesus can do through our faith because we are the hands and feet. In your name we pray, amen.